Catherine Korn. Catherine is the estate planning and probate section president for this year. Catherine. Thanks very much, Anne, and thank you everybody for attending this year. Um, want to remind everyone that we are doing this over a two day period. So if you haven't signed up for tomorrow's presentation, it is going to be on property tax planning from Prop 13 to Prop 19. It's presented by Doug Bonney and Kevin Holt of Bonney Law Group, and it will assist you in navigating your clients through a shifting uh, landscape that is almost uh, grumbling beneath our feet as I speak. Um, before I turn this over to our two wonderful presenters today, I do want to stop and thank Mechanics Bank for their continued support. We appreciate it. Uh, the estate planning uh, section just cannot thank you enough. So without further ado, I'd like to present Andy Verrier and Ryan Sapanek, who are going to talk today about court-appointed neutrals and experts highlighting the benefits and risks of using them. Thank you very much. Andy, Ryan. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, and thanks, Anne, for the introduction. I'm Andy Verrier, and, and with me is my partner, Ryan Sapanek. Uh, we are partners in the litigation department at Hartog Bear in Hand down in Orinda. Uh, I'm looking at the panelist list or the attendance list, and I see a lot of folks that we know and some others that uh, you know, if we were in person, we'd probably be meeting for the first time. Uh, but what we practice in primarily is trust and estates disputes, financial elder abuse, related civil uh, litigation. Uh, and we both serve as referees, both for accounting disputes, uh, discovery disputes, and, and other appointments under uh, CCP 638 and 639, which we'll get into a bit later today. Um, so as Catherine said, we're here to talk a bit about court appointed neutrals and experts. Uh, and that's gonna cover uh, 638 and 639 referees. Andy before, Andy, before you go any further, let me go ahead and, and share the screen here so we can get the PowerPoint up. All right. Okay. All right, thanks Ryan. So. Yep. We're gonna be talking about court appointed neutrals and experts, and that's gonna cover referees, private judges, and then 730 experts. And I think a lot of times when folks think about referees and private judges, they're really thinking about litigation. And that's obviously a place where it comes up a lot, but something that uh, Ryan and I have been thinking about a lot lately and have discussed with both Judge George and Judge Bean and Alameda is how we can leverage some of these neutrals not only for litigation purposes, but to help streamline the uh, administration of trusts and estates that still require uh, uncontested petitions that have to go through the courts for myriad reasons to facilitate the closing of estates and trusts. So we'll touch on that a little bit, uh, and then we'll talk about the use of court-appointed experts. So here's a, an overview of the topics we're going to go through. When we talk about referees, that's where we're going to start. And we're going to start out with sort of the broad considerations of when a referee can be useful and when it's authorized by the statute. So you're going to have threshold issues of uh, whether it's agreed to or not, and that's going to control which statute you're operating under. Uh, then we'll go through the requirements of the statute and what could or would qualify for a 638 or 639 referee. And then we'll dig into the real nuts and bolts of how you can go about getting a referee appointed, either by stipulation uh, or contested motion. Uh, we're gonna talk about the grounds for opposition, uh, what you wanna make sure you assert if you are opposing uh, an appointment, uh, the requirements for how the matter proceeds. And this is really, this is really gonna talk about some of the, the ways that proceeding before a referee can uh, benefit the parties and also some of the downsides that you've got to be sure you talk about with your client beforehand and keep in mind when you're proceeding before a referee. Uh, we're going to go through how decisions and recommendations of 638 and 639 referees operate. Uh, 
uh, and they operate a little differently depending on the nature of the appointment. So we'll go through uh, the process for getting the recommendation uh, or the decision, how that's presented to the court, what's needed to protect, to protect and perfect the recommendation when it goes to the court, uh, and then uh, how that's treated uh, for purposes of the parties proceeding through the case. Then we'll get to where the rubber hits the road, which is fees. Uh, and that's gonna be something that you're gonna consider at the outset uh, of the appointment. But uh, when you're considering it at the outset, you really wanna look down the line to how those fees are treated. Uh, and we'll talk about some best practices there in terms of making sure that uh, consideration of treatment of those fees as taxable costs or not uh, is properly laid out at the outset and apportionment of those fees. <clears throat> and then we'll try to bring it together with uh, and dealing the benefits and the risks in a, in a readily digestible format uh, towards the end. So that's going to be our discussion of 638 and 639 referees. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan then to talk about uh, temporary judges uh, and a lot of the same considerations that go into that and how you can really leverage temporary judges in the current uh, Bay Area, Bay Area uh, court climate to potentially streamline the administration of both estates and trusts for things like headstead petitions uh, or petitions to uh, administer estates. Uh, then we're going to talk a bit about court appointed experts under evidence code 730. Uh, circumstances you want to do that, what the process is for appointment, uh, payment of those uh, experts, and then practically speaking, how the use of those experts can impact uh, both pre-trial litigation and the trial itself. Uh, and that'll segue us into the fees and the benefits and the risks of 730 experts. I, I just, <clears throat> I think that was, that was a great summary, Andy. I, I just wanna emphasize one thing. Um, you know, the reason, um, the reason this presentation is so timely um, and really the, the instigator behind this topic um, for Andy and myself and so many others is the fact that um, the courts are so congested right now. And, um, and the courts are underfunded. Um, and and the, the primary cause of those things uh, have been exacerbated by COVID. Um, and in some of the courts in the Bay Area, we're looking at delays of you know, nine, 10 months before we get our first hearing on a court petition. Um, so it's really incumbent upon us as lawyers. And I think the judges are looking at us to be creative, to look at what tools we have in our arsenal and be creative with those tools to help them out um, and also help out, help our clients out um, given these delays that, you know, I don't really see these delays um, uh, seeding anytime in the future. So we really need to get creative. We need to think about what options we have. And these two options, uh, a referee, temporary judge, um, and, Evidence Code 730 experts are tools in our arsenal that um, are underutilized right now. And, and we're gonna walk through these tools and, and how we can better utilize them at this time. All right, so th the first question that you're gonna ask yourself when you are considering a referee appointment is how are the parties working together? Because if the parties are on the same page, it opens up a lot more opportunities for appointment of a referee, uh, or as we get into it later, a stipulated private judge. And that doesn't mean that the parties agree on the outcome of the case. You know, we would uh, be without a job if everyone got along every time and trust administration. What I'm really talking about is if the parties are on the same page that they want to get this resolved and they want to try and get it resolved in an expeditious fashion. So uh, if folks are paddling in the same direction using our, our cartoon here, then it opens up the opportunity for a CCP 638 uh, appointment. Uh, and Ryan, if you could go to the next slide. We know which one of us is who on this picture, Andy, or do you have an opinion on that? I'm probably the one using more energy and going nowhere, and you're probably being a little <laughs> more efficient there. Uh, I disagree, but okay, let's move <laughs> on. So there's, there's two statutes that authorize the appointment of a referee. It's 638 and 639. And if everyone's getting along, then you can use a 638 appointment pretty strategically. And there's really two reasons that it's authorized under 638 for appointing referee. 
That's either to resolve all of the issues in the action, which is uh, called, as we get to later portions of the statute, a consensual general referral to a referee, or uh, a lesser referral would be to ascertain facts to enable uh, the court to make another ruling. That's a 638B reference uh, or a limited reference to a 638 referee. And if, when you think about that, that latter uh, option, what you're really talking about there is perhaps the parties have a discrete factual issue that they think could be um, dispositive of the case. They don't want to wait around for the court to have time for trial on it but they want to have a judge be the one to apply the law to the facts. So what they could do in that situation is stipulate to have a referee hold an evidentiary hearing on that discrete factual issue and make a recommendation to the court with the direction that the court would then apply the law to the facts afterwards. So your clients would still have the comfort of a judge being the one to apply the law, but have the streamlined, streamlined process of a referee being the one uh, considering the evidence and making a recommendation on the facts. And I, it, you know, a lot of people hear about a 638 uh, stipulated reference, and they think that this is the same as a private temporary judge. And it's different. Uh, and it's different because the scope of the authority of a referee appointed under 638 is statutorily described uh, in 638 through 644. Whereas, as, as Ryan will get into later, um, a stipulated private judge arises under uh, rights that parties have under Article 6, Section 21 of the California Constitution. But really our threshold issue here is if the parties uh, are on the same page that they want this to go to a referee, they have the opportunity to go to a 638 referee under certain circumstances. If not, their default is gonna be 639. So under CCP 639, there are really five buckets uh, where a referee can be appointed. And it's important to keep these categories in mind because they circumscribe the instances in which a referee can be appointed, which will be a, a topic we get into when we talk about objecting to a motion to appoint a referee. So for our purposes in probate, there are really two main buckets that these referees are appointed under. One is an accounting referee. And I think for a long time, and particularly to the work towards the ends of Judge Sugiyama's tenure in our probate uh, department, we saw a lot of accounting referees appointed. And those are appointed under 639A1 and 2. And the appointment of a referee for accounting purposes can be as broad or narrow as the parties want. You can have the entire accounting petition resolved by the referee. You can have discrete objections to the accounting resolved. Uh, or you can just have the accounting portion resolved and then other blended claims carved out for the court. Uh, the other big one we see a lot of is 639A5, which everyone else refers to as a discovery referee. And we see that especially frequently now with both the loss of our dedicated discovery uh, department, gosh, almost 10 years ago now, and the increase of the discovery facilitator program uh, around the Bay Area. And it's been implemented in Contra Costa uh, about seven years ago, I think, and that was based off of Sonoma's program. We've seen similar issues starting to be codified in the Civil Discovery Act, and I think we should anticipate that the courts are going to be pushing parties more and more to these sorts of um, formalized informal resolution options for discovery. Andy, uh, so if I could just jump in, is it your um, impression in Contra Costa County Probate Court that when a party request a discovery referee under 639A5, the, the judge, whether it be Judge George or Judge Festermacher, will typically grant that request? Yeah, I think that, you know, the judges have huge burdens uh, placed on them already. And as you were noting earlier, Ryan, with the budget cuts, they're short staffed, they've got limited time, and they're dealing with messy contests on the merits already, such that getting getting complex discovery motions before them, choose through a lot of their time, through their support staff time, through the research attorney's time. And they are interested uh, in getting those matters out for resolution. By and large, discovery is supposed to be self-executing. We all know when it comes down to it that it can't always be because clients take positions and attorneys take positions and they're not always in harmony. So I think that if the 
if the opportunity to send an appropriate matter to a discovery referee is presented, courts are going to make that order if there are grounds to do so. And we'll get into sort of what parties need to be able to show to get that appointment because there are particular requirements under the statute for reference to uh, a discovery referee. But I think if you can present this in a way uh, that a court feels comfortable, they can make the findings that more than nine times out of 10, you're gonna get that order appointing a referee. And that can have a lot of downstream benefits to the uh, smooth litigation of the case and the timely conclusion of the litigation. Andy, let me, let me ask you just one other question. Sure. Um, when a party requests a discovery referee or, or a referee under any of these prongs of uh, Code of Civil Procedures uh, 639A and another party objects and the court grants the order appointing the referee, is that an interlocutory order? Um, in other words, may a party immediately appeal it? So it's an interlocutory order. It would only be appealable by extraordinary writ. Uh, and I think a couple exceptions where that would be uh, appealable would really come if there were an instance of sanctions imposed. And then you're not looking at the order itself, but let's say you've got a referee uh, appointed, they recommend imposition of discovery sanctions over $5,000 that order itself is gonna be immediately appealable. And when that uh, order of the referee is, uh, is appealed, the Court of Appeal would have the discretion to review the order appointing the referee contemporaneously with the uh, recommendation from the referee if it uh, includes uh, an order of sanctions, $5,000. Uh, but generally speaking, the a party's gonna to have to proceed by writ to get this reviewed while the matter's pending. So then we've got 639A3 and A4, and these don't come up too often, but one time uh, that I have seen it used uh, is when you have issues of Whittlesey or Tan uh, Terry B. Conlon arguments that a trustee or fiduciary is improperly using estate or trust funds to defend against an action. And I've seen that folded into uh, a discovery referee appointment when a party is contending that a fiduciary shouldn't be able to use trust funds uh, to defend against these discovery disputes. And the way that that practically proceeds is almost a two-part analysis by the referee. They're gonna resolve the discovery dispute uh, and then to the extent they need to take evidence on the use of funds in that dispute they can, or more likely it's just gonna be a legal argument as to what the trust authorizes and whether or not uh, the use of funds falls within the scope of the trustee's uh, authorization. So that could really fall under a 639A3 argument where there's a uh, issue that's arisen under the pleadings or a motion to preclude the use of trust funds by, uh, by a trustee and it requires a referee to resolve that factual dispute of if it's appropriate for a trustee to do so. So if that's something that's come up in your case, you know, different different judges handle it differently. Um, some of them will, from the outset, preclude trustees or uh, other fiduciaries from using a state or trust funds. Others like to take the backwards looking approach, uh, but mostly they don't like to deal with it at all. So that can be a way to get that issue uh, before a referee and a potential resolution before the court, uh, well short of having to go through tr trial and do that backward looking uh, analysis that Whittlesey and Terry generally uh, evaluate. So we've talked a bit about 638 and 639. What's the practical difference between the two? Well, it really comes down to the nature of uh, the uh, report or recommendation made by the referee. Uh, and this is a, a two-part test. If you have a consensual general reference, which we talked about under 638, meaning you have a stipulated appointment of a 638 referee and it's for the entire matter, the report and recommendation of that uh, referee is actually the judgment of the court. It gets sent in, it's entered thereon, uh, and it's appealable like, uh, like any other order of the court. It's not subject to review by the trial court. Uh, it goes straight to the court of appeal if someone takes issue with it and it's an appealable order. Uh, the second half of that is everything else, including limited purpose 638 references, uh, are only advisory. They get submitted to the trial court. There's a period of time uh, the parties can object to it. It's generally 10 days after uh, the referee serves and files their recommendation. 
uh, unless you carve that into the order appointing the referee. Uh, and then the court can approve, modify, or reject the referee's report. But, you know, let's be real about this. The court has reached a point where they've determined this person is uh, qualified and appropriate to serve as a referee. They've delegated to some degree consideration and resolution of this issue to the referee. Uh, it is very unlikely that you're going to sway the court from the referee's recommendation. There are times that the court does that. Um, and usually what happens is the court will modify it. Uh, but you know, the, the importance of the referee's recommendation and the deference that trial courts give is, is so clear that we've even got case law out there from the Court of Appeal. We've got this Ruisi Buterio case where they recognize that a referee's recommendations are entitled to great weight. And I don't think we should delude ourselves uh, that it's gonna be anything to the contrary. The court is trying to streamline the administration of the case, streamline the matter to trial. If you get a recommendation from uh, a referee, uh, unless it is something that is uh, really out of left field, you should anticipate that the court is likely going to uh, affirm and adopt that recommendation. So, what is our process for appointing a referee under 638 and 639? Well, like we showed at the beginning, to get a 638 appointment, you've got to have a stipulation. Uh, if it's a 639, it may be by stipulation uh, or it may be by motion. And when would you have a stipulated appointment under 639? Well, if you are doing a discovery referee, you cannot have a discovery referee under 638. It is always going to be under 639. Uh, sometimes if you have an accounting referee, if it's not a general appointment uh, or the parties don't want it to be uh, a binding decision, but would rather uh, have the opportunity to object to it, they could do a 639 appointment. Uh, but under both uh, the stipulation and the motion, you've got to present it to the court in uh, a manner that satisfies all the statutory uh, requirements so that the court has before it the sufficient evidence to make the findings of appointment. The Judicial Council has given us uh, an optional form for use, ADR 109. And I frankly use that every time. Uh, why? Because I know that it tracks the issues for consideration by the court. And it's in a format that is familiar to the courts for consideration. One caveat to using ADR 109 is it does not include with it a hearing date or time. So from a practical perspective, if you're going up and window filing this, you can have them stamp on the first page a uh, hearing date and time if this is a motion. Uh, but a best practice for you is draft up a separate notice of motion and motion, submit it along with the ADR 109 and you'll get your hearing date on there. And then you don't have to get into, you know, sort of frivolous ancillary litigation about whether the motion was properly noticed. It seems uh, so absurd that no one would do it, but I've in fact had to litigate that issue in front of Judge George. Uh, I don't think it warranted much attention, but it cost the client a couple hundred bucks to draft an opposition. And so submitting a notice of hearing ahead of time will make sure that everything's procedurally buttoned up. And so what are the issues? Andy, that you I, let me jump in for one second. Yeah. Um, in your experience, are the probate judges in Contra Costa, are they receptive to a request for appointment of referee under, six, under, under um, uh, 639 pursuant to an ex parte application? I think if it's stipulated, uh, they would certainly consider it. Uh, if you are going for a uh, discovery referee or an accounting referee and it's contested, I think the best uh, practice there and what's probably the procedurally correct manner is to file the motion for appointment get your hearing date and then uh, move ex parte to shorten time on the hearing date. Uh, and I've had success with uh, Judge George in that process uh, because they're comfortable that the matter is being properly, uh, properly briefed by both sides. The court has the discretion, of course, to shorten the briefing time on a motion. Uh, and so when reviewed by the Court of Appeal and, and this uh, one that I'm referring to is actually pending before the Court of Appeal right now, uh, the court can feel confident that all the I's have been dotted and the T's have been crossed in terms of uh, giving both sides a fair opportunity to brief and argue the motion. Uh, so a couple issues you want to consider when you are putting together the stipulation or the motion to appoint the referee. 
what's the issue for resolution? Which type of appointment are you looking for? And this goes back to the language of 638 and 639. If you are doing a discovery referee appointment, it's gotta be a 639 appointment. You're not going to have a 638. Uh, likewise, if you wanna have a uh, review uh, as an option by the court, you don't wanna do a stipulated general uh, reference under 638 because your clients will lose that opportunity. So really look into the elements of the code. Uh, as part of your materials, we're gonna give you copies of 638 and 639 uh, and make sure that what you're asking for is authorized by the code. What's the scope of the reference? So, you know, you can have a discovery referee appointed for all purposes. You can have them appointed just for written discovery, third party discovery. Lots of times we get into uh, sometimes nasty continued depositions of family members who have a lot of bad blood. There are objections to privacy. There are threatens of, uh, threats of protective orders. Do you wanna have a referee be able to uh, attend those depositions and rule on those uh, objections in real time to keep the depositions moving and keep the discovery flowing towards trial. So think about what matters you want the referee to be able to decide. Who's the referee gonna be? This is obviously a, a general point of contention. Sometimes folks can agree on the identity of the referee, even if they're not agreeing that a referee should be appointed. Uh, and this is a good thing to work out ahead of time. Uh, I think it helps makes clients feel more comfortable with the process where they may be unhappy that a referee is appointed, but at least they feel they have buy-in to the identity of the referee if one is appointed. Uh, it doesn't preclude them from objecting to the appointment altogether, uh, but parties don't always get along. And if they can't agree on it, uh, CCP 640 provides a process whereby each side can nominate uh, referees, submit them to the court, and then the court decides. Uh, how's the referee going to be compensated? This is obviously a big sticking point as well, uh, because one of the main uh, complaints that clients have about appointment of referees is that you're going to be paying another lawyer to come into this issue. So at the outset, you want to nail down how the referee is going to be compensated. You want to talk about hourly rate. You can include uh, the maximum number of hours to be spent by the referee on each discrete issue. Sometimes this appointment is going to be a uh, a single reference, you know, they are resolving a single accounting petition. Other times there's going to be serial issues, particularly when you have discovery and, and broad appointments. So if you anticipate having four or five, six different discovery disputes go before the referee, you may need to put a cap on the number of hours spent to try and control the expense. Uh, and then lastly, one thing you want to try and carve out is how the referee is going to report to the court. You know, if this is a 638 referral, you know that they're going to submit their order and that's going to become the order of the court. If it's anything other than a 638 general referral, uh, there's going to be a period of time for them to report. Uh, generally, that's 20 days and it's going to be in writing. Uh, but if this is an appointment where they're trying to resolve things on the eve of trial, you may not have 20 days for it because that report goes in. It's non-binding. The parties have 10 days to object and then the court rules upon it. So you may want to shorten a period of time for the referee to report to the court. And these are all things that you want to think through at the outset to avoid having to go back to the court to modify the order down the line. So we've got nope. the, we've got the uh, stipulation or motion for appointment. Uh, at the same time, you're going to be submitting an order for appointing a referee as well. And this is largely going to track uh, the stipulation or motion. Uh, again, there's an optional form for use ADR 110. I like to use that again because it's something that you know is going to hit on all the statutory requirements. It's going to have all the fine findings that warrant appointment. And this is particularly important both on the ability to pay and the need for a discovery referee. Uh, you are going to have to put forth at the outset uh, any objection to your party's ability to pay. Uh, if you're objecting to the appointment of a referee. And the finding by the court is not that the parties have the ability to pay, it's that no party has established an inability to pay. And uh, really our, our proof that we're gonna be putting forward is that denial of, uh, or the party's requirement to pay these fees is going to constitute a denial of their access to justice, right? We don't have a system where parties have to pay for access to the courts 
although they have to pay certain filing fees. But uh, really, they have the ability to expedite resolution and potentially save money by spending some upfront. So if there's an issue about the party's respective abilities to pay, you want to raise it in the objection. Uh, but if you're pushing for the appointment, this is the place where you want to make sure that the court includes a finding that no party has established an inability to pay. Uh, you're going to talk about the scope of the appointment, compensation of the referee. You're never going to get to use court facilities. That's uh, one that I don't think is even alterable under the form. Uh, how the referee is going to report. And then a really important part on this form order is the certification by referee. And this is the acceptance of the proposed referee. It's required by statute, and it includes the form language. So if you are going to draft your own uh, personal order appointing the referee, make sure that you at least reference the language included in the certification by referee. It's really handy when you're applying for appointment of a referee to circulate the order to the proposed referee ahead of time so they can make sure that they are comfortable with it. You can get their signature on the acceptance before it goes to the court. And that way, if the court does appoint the referee, it'll be effective immediately. Otherwise, the appointment won't be effective until certified by the referee. Now, one thing to keep in mind there is Obviously, you are seeking the appointment of someone to serve as a judicial officer. You don't want to be having ex parte communications with them. So when you circulate that order, uh, do be sure to copy opposing counsel so that there is no concerns about ex parte communications. All right, so we've got our motion or stipulation and we've got the proposed order. Well, if it's a stipulation, this isn't going to apply. But if it's a contested motion, uh, the parties have an opportunity to object to it. Uh, and as we look through here, there are really very limited grounds on which a party is going to be able to object, but it's important that they be brought up because uh, if a party does not object to the appointment of the referee uh, and they appear before them, they are deemed to have waived those objections. There may be grounds that arise after the fact that that could cause uh, issue, but as to anything that is in existence at the time of the motion, uh, your client needs to raise them before appointment or forever hold their peace. So first and foremost, the objections have to be in writing. You can't raise them orally like you can under probate code 1043 for an objection to a petition. It's got to be in writing and it's going to be resolved by the court, not the referee. So what are the grounds on which you can uh, object? Well, the first one is that the issue doesn't qualify for appointment of a referee. So this brings us back to the language of 638 and 639. Generally speaking, these are going to be pretty straightforward as to whether or not they fall under the code. But one that uh, can be really litigated is the complexity of discovery disputes necessitating the appointment of a referee. So sometimes you'll be looking in your crystal ball down the road and see, gosh, there's going to be a lot of discovery disputes coming. Why don't we get someone in here now to uh, resolve these issues as they come up rather than playing defense uh, four months from now when we've got a whole host of motions. The challenge you're going to face is putting that in a, uh, in a form that the court can appreciate the complexity of the disputes because really they're not supposed to appoint discovery referees absent uh, complex discovery issues or uh, serial discovery disputes. So you want to be able to explain to the court uh, in a manner that they feel comfortable making findings that this is uh, an issue with many discovery disputes, uh, or this is an issue that requires uh, resolution by a third party because you've got a shortened period of time and the court simply doesn't have the resources to address it. So try to anticipate uh, the uh, opposing parties objections on this ground because this is the one that you see most frequently for discovery referees. Then we get to the lack of the ability to pay. And this is one that we talked about a bit before. This doesn't go to the uh, refusal to appoint a referee, but really the apportionment of fees between the parties. And practically speaking, that can lead to the uh, party seeking appointment to withdraw. You know, if you are going to have one party saddled with the full expense of the referee, they may be disinclined to proceed with the referee. So if, for instance, you're representing uh, a party on a contingency basis, you have the ability to get a fee waiver. You can likewise go in uh, in opposition to a motion to appoint a referee and say, listen, we've got a fee waiver. My clients don't have the ability to pay. It's unfair to burden them with the expense because it precludes them from meaningfully participating in discovery. Uh, likewise, if you're court-appointed counsel in a conservatorship and you've got a referee appointed, 
it may be that your client is indigent and it is uh, improper for them to be burdened with the expense of a referee. You want to be sure to bring these issues up at the outset and explain why it is uh, with as much evidence as you can uh, why your clients can't pay. And sometimes that's going to require some confidential financial information being disclosed. Uh, there's no real way around that, uh, but what you can do is seek to seal that information, or if it's in a conservatorship, uh, you could try and have that placed in a confidential file so these aren't out there for the world to see. Andy, Andy, one, one uh, issue I have faced as a referee is with the 639 order, um, the, the judge um, checks the box that says, you know, no, none of the parties have an inability to pay. And the judge apportions the fees equally between the parties. We proceed with the referee proceeding. Referee submits the report. The court enters an order adopting the report. And the court in the order says, you know, blank amount of fees are owed by that party and blank amount of fees are owed by the other party. And the party who loses doesn't pay the referee. Now, the, the referee, typically the, the remedy is to file a motion for contempt. But with a motion for contempt, the movement has to show that the party they're moving against has the ability to pay, um, which creates, certainly in my case, you know, my defense was look at the referee order. The judge already determined that that party was, was, um, was able to pay. Um, have you faced that issue before? Um, I haven't faced the uh, issue yet, although there's a, a motion pending before Judge George uh, in a matter I'm involved in next week on this very issue where a party refused to pay the uh, referee's fees. Judge George made that finding uh, of no party establishing an inability to pay. Uh, and there's a motion for contempt on for that very issue. Uh, so I, you know, I think you're right that this constitutes a factual finding by the court that there's been no determination of an inability to pay, uh, but you know, to the same end, that's almost a negative finding. It's not an affirmative finding of an ability to pay. It's a finding that they have not demonstrated an inability to pay. And I think once you get to those contempt proceedings, the challenge you'll face is that contempt is a quasi-criminal proceeding. The burden is going to be on the person pursuing contempt to uh, establish beyond a reasonable doubt contempt. And so I don't think a finding of an absence of inability uh, is going to be the same to carry the day. That doesn't mean that the court isn't going to view this as, uh, practically speaking, a situation where they're just refusing to pay uh, despite being able to. Um, but it may be that uh, in addition to the motion for contempt, uh, you want to pursue some form of sanctions uh, as well, because that's going to have a different standard of proof uh, and may be uh, subject to the court's prior findings. But the bottom line is make sure you pay your referees. I think that's where we really want to go with this. <laughs> so, so we've got this issue of ability to pay, and then we've got the objections to the particular referee. And these seem sort of broad and like they generally fall within, their, uh, within the same scope of CCP 171, challenging a judge for cause. But one a uh, sneaky element that falls in here that folks don't necessarily key into is the first one. Want of qualifications rendering a person competent as a juror. And those are defined in CCP 203. And there are two that actually can sneak up on you in uh, a request for appointment. And that is persons who are not citizens of the United States and persons who are not domiciled in the state of California. So particularly now with COVID and the increase in people working remotely from all over, it is not uncommon to have your referee now living in uh, Oregon or New York or Montana or Idaho, and they continue their practice in Contra Costa because who needs to be here in person when everything's remote? If they're no longer a resident of California, they don't qualify uh, as a juror uh, and they can't serve as a referee. And likewise, we have plenty of folks that are members of the bar in California and, and members of our bar in Contra Costa uh, who are not U.S. citizens. It's not a requirement to be a licensed attorney. Uh, and they likewise are not competent as a juror uh, and would not be able to serve as a referee. I've frankly never seen that issue raised, but it jumped out as me as uh, an issue that could come up uh, on a collateral attack down the line on a referee's, uh, a referee's uh, recommendation. 
So it is something you want to make sure is buttoned down at the outset when you are vetting your referees. And last is the scope of the reference. And this, again, isn't something that's going to go to whether or not a referee should be appointed, but what the issues that should be resolved by the referee are. And so the times I've seen this come up are when uh, parties are fighting over if an entire petition should be referred to a referee or only portions of it. So if you've got a blended petition that has an accounting in it, as well as a claim for elder abuse, do you want the whole thing resolved by the referee or just the accounting portion? And then the, the rest is uh, severed or bifurcated and, and sent back to the judge after resolution. Likewise, the scope of a discovery appointment, do you want it for all purposes? Uh, do you wanna have it uh, carved out from the discovery facilitator program, which is always something you wanna bake into the order if you do? Uh, or do you want this to be for discrete issues and you can come back for appointment as new issues arise? I think that's generally uh, terribly inefficient, uh, but it may be something that's required to get buy-in from your client uh, to the referee process. All right, so we've got our stipulation or motion, we've got our order, we've got our objection, uh, how you've now got your referee appointed, how does the matter proceed? Well, this is one of the big benefits to using a referee is the flexibility that can afford in addressing matters. Um, judges are limited by the hours of operation of the court, by the hundreds, if not thousands of other matters on their dockets, um, by the constraints on court staff and research abilities. When you get a referee, you have the ability to work uh, towards streamlined hearing dates to flexibility in briefing formats. You can get, one of the things I like to do at the outset of uh, appointments, particularly in discovery appointments, is to send out a letter to the parties explaining the format of briefing. There's no need to have separate statements uh, under the rules of court. You can do it through a letter brief. You can do it on an expedited briefing schedule. Um, you can determine the ways in which matters will be submitted to the referee for resolution that can relieve the parties of a lot of the expense of formal uh, law in motion in discovery disputes. Uh, and so that is the area of the greatest flexibility for referees. They can also set hearings in, uh, in time periods where courts wouldn't otherwise be operating. You can have an afternoon hearing. Gosh, you could have a hearing on a Saturday if your referee is really committed, uh, and that's the only time that works for the parties. And you're never going to have that sort of convenience uh, when you're combined, confined to uh, the court schedule. Uh, but at the same time, these are still uh, judicial officers, and they're bound by uh, certain requirements in considering matters and reaching their resolutions. So one of the most important ones that comes up and uh, can become a thorn during uh, the court shutdowns and COVID and, and the limited access we have now is that papers either have to be filed with the court or accompanied by a declaration stating that they've been filed by the court. And that's in rule of court 2.400B. I think pretty much any time you uh, start up with a referee, they'll advise you of this because they can't base their ruling on papers that aren't filed uh, or submitted for filing. So what does that mean with COVID? Well. Everyone knows that you submit something, it goes off into the ether and hopefully you get it back two or three weeks later. That isn't gonna fly when it comes to these sort of expedited resolutions that we're trying to have before referees. So you wanna be sure that you submit a declaration along with it to the referee so that if you are Dropbox filing your uh, discovery motion, you can get it to the referee the same day to start consideration of the matter. Uh, likewise, you're not gonna have ex parte communications with your referee. Uh, and this can be difficult for folks that are just starting out with referees. You know, you are having attorneys that are your colleagues, uh, retired judges that you see at professional events, people that you have a general professional or personal relationship with. Just like you wouldn't mention your case to Judge George or Judge Fenstermacher or Commissioner Sundin or Judge Bean if you saw them at a professional event, you're not going to do it with these uh, referees. And, and it's got to be kept in mind when you're communicating with them about other cases you've got with them. Uh, or you're submitting matters for their consideration. It's got to be done in a manner where everyone is uh, a part of the communication. Uh, and then th these last two go to the way that the, the matters are considered. It's done in an informal setting. 
right? You are not sitting in a courtroom having the referee consider it. You don't have a bailiff there. You don't have uh, the clerk. But that doesn't mean that the consideration of evidence or the requirements for presentation of evidence or the burdens of proof or presumptions applying to these motions or proceedings are any different than they are in a court. Uh, they proceed with the same admissibility requirements for evidence, the same burdens of proof, and the same presumptions. So you've got to keep that in mind. This is a less formal proceeding in terms of the pomp and circumstance, but it has the same judicial requirements as a matter proceeding before a judge. So we've gone through appointment, objection, uh, order, briefing. Now we've got the uh, decisions and the recommendations of the referee. We talked about this a bit earlier. Under 638 general reference, it's going to be binding in the same way as an order of the court. If it's anything but a general reference uh, under 638, which would be any appointment under 639 or a limited appointment under 638, it's going to be a uh, recommendation. And this can prove challenging if people aren't prepared for it because there's nothing baked into the code that sets a time period within which the court for, to act upon it. And the courts don't always know that a recommendation has come in from a referee because it doesn't trigger anything internally. There's no hearing date set on it. The code just requires that once the recommendation is submitted, parties have 10 days to object, and then the court can uh, adopt, modify, or reject the recommendation. It doesn't have to hold a hearing. Sometimes the court will as a courtesy to the parties or to clarify grounds in the objection. But uh, something that the parties should do uh, if you're in Contra Costa is reach out to the probate examiners to see if you can get the matter set on a hearing. Or alternatively, um, if an objection is uh, filed or if no objection is filed, consider going in ex parte to get the matter before the court so the court knows that further action needs to be taken. Because until the court adopts, modifies, or rejects that recommendation, it's non-binding. It's just a recommendation. So if you're in a discovery situation where you're trying to compel a third party to produce documents or compel someone to attend a deposition or answer discovery requests, you're not going to get anything until it's reduced to an order. So you've got to be vigilant in following up and making sure that uh, the court takes action. Uh, I know that Judge George recently has had a couple referee appointments where it's come down to the eve of trial and she has really been on top of uh, making sure that those recommendations are considered and acted upon in a timely manner. Uh, you know, we are lucky to have judges that are that on top of it, that's not gonna be the case everywhere you are in the state. Uh, so it's really on the parties to make sure they drive this this issue forward after the recommendation is submitted. Andy, let me let me jump in for a moment. So, are there for, for a referee under probate under uh, CCP six thirty nine A? Are there any um, standards or guidelines um, that pertain to the trial judge's decision to adopt the referee's report, modify it, reject it? Let me give you a hypothetical. Say a referee is appointed under 639A1 and they conduct an evidentiary hearing on an issue and they submit a report to the trial judge. The trial judge reviews the report. What, what does the trial judge have guiding its decision? What kind of, you know, court of appeal judges have standards? What does the trial judge have? Is it utterly up to their discretion? Yeah, so the, the provisions of 644 give the trial judge the, uh, the authority to adopt, modify, or reject. But on a practical letter level, this goes back to uh, the case cited earlier from the Court of Appeal, that the court is really going to be giving deference to the referee. The referee is the one in a six, you know, you mentioned 639A1, in an accounting dispute, who's going to be taking and receiving evidence and considering it. So I think that the court is, practically speaking, going to be looking at that recommendation to make sure it has the, uh, the self-contained integrity to support the resolution, that there are, you know, in appellate language, there's a sufficiency of the evidence there that the court can look at and glean how this resolution is reached. That there were credibility findings made or implicit findings of credibility that are going to give the court comfort that this is the right outcome. I think the times where you see the court modifying or rejecting it are largely when you're talking about legal issues that are in there. And maybe the court looks at the recommendation and thinks, gee, maybe their factual determinations are correct, but their application of the law to, to the facts is different from how I would do it. And ultimately my neck's on the line 
uh, if this goes to San Francisco to a three judge panel. And I wanna make sure that the application of the law to the facts is correct. I think that is the, that's the place where I've seen the most uh, discretion exercised by the trial court judges in reviewing uh, and modifying uh, the referee's recommendation. All right, so we've gotten through all of the guts of it. Now we're talking about the money, which is where it always comes down to for the clients. What are the referee's fees and how are they paid? Under 638, it is required under the statute that the parties agree to the, the way that the referee's fees are paid. So even if you've agreed on everything else and the parties don't agree to the method of payment of the referee, you're not gonna be under 638. But an important point of this is how those fees are then treated. If this is a 638 general appointment, those fees are not recoverable costs at the, uh, at the back end of a case by the prevailing party. So there's a case called Car Business Enterprises versus City of Chowchilla, where this very issue happened. The matter was referred to a 638 referee. The parties, as part of that, uh, were required to stipulate to how the fees would be paid. And the court then rejected uh, the award of fees to the prevailing party because it was not a recoverable cost. It had been agreed to by the parties ahead of time. So what does this mean? If you want to be able to recover your fees for a 638 uh, referee, you wanna spell that out on the front end. You wanna have certainty in the order appointing the referee that these will be treated as recoverable costs uh, or not. Uh, and bake that into the order so that there's some certainty to the clients that they can recover them. 639 fees, uh, on the other hand, and potentially 638 uh, non-general appointments uh, are subject to recovery in the discretion of the court. So there's the case de Blaise versus Superior Court and most wor worshipful sons of light that uh, address this. Uh, the court may uh, award them, but they also may not. So this again is something where your best practice is to spell that out ahead of time, especially if you're in a situation where the parties are agreeing on the apportionment of fees as opposed to having the court, the court impose that over the objection of the party, spell out in your order appointing referee that these will or will not be recoverable fees or recoverable costs by the prevailing party. That way you'll know whether or not to include them on your memorandum of costs on the back end. And I gotta tell you, these can, these can rack up. You know, if you are in a discovery referee appointment where it is something that's gonna have five, six, seven, eight uh, motions brought before the referee, which is by no means uncommon, especially uh, in the crush of time before trial, uh, those fees can rack up in the tens of thousands of dollars and clients are certainly eager to recover those if they're in the prevailing party. So we've gone through the guts of the appointment, the recommendation, the fees, let's bring it home. What are the benefits and risks of the referee? I think the real benefits are the flexibility that having a referee can bring. You're not gonna be in a situation where if you're down on the peninsula and you're going out through a master calendar, you're gonna be trailing all of the criminal cases. Uh, you know, us in uh, probate and our colleagues in civil are really the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to getting a courtroom. Uh, the only way you can have real certainty outside of a single set assignment uh, is to get a referee or a private judge where you can pick the start date. You know that you've got someone committed to it uh, and you're not going to be continued month on month. I had a matter going out through master calendar in San Mateo where we were brought back to master calendar five times before we got a courtroom. It took us 10 months from our first set trial date before we actually went out for trial. And those continuances in and of themselves cost the clients tens of thousands of dollars. So, you know, when we talk about the costs of a referee, we've really got to uh, compare those to the costs of proceeding through the trial courts. And some of our courts are uh, better at getting things out in an expedited fashion. Uh, others, like Ryan said, have a lot of constraints that preclude their ability to timely address these issues and in turn are going to cost the clients a lot of money. What else does it do? It gives us the flexibility of having longer sessions on the record, which in turn can shorten our days. You know, in Contra Costa, you're not going to get more than a half day of trial uh, in, uh, in probate. For Judge George, you, she's got Wednesdays through Fridays every other week. For Judge Fenstermacher, you're going to get an afternoon and then you'll get the next date assigned. Uh, 
if you've got a referee, you're going to have someone that is devoted to this case. They are getting paid to pay attention to it, and they're going to clear time for it. So you can go eight to six with limited breaks. Uh, you can have uh, longer days with consecutive days so the matter can be resolved sooner. Uh, and unlike a judge who uh, has to give equal attention to all the cases on their docket, you're going to have someone that is really focused on this issue. It can also provide more privacy. You know, practically speaking, referee proceedings are open to the public. Uh, anyone has the right to attend, but nobody ever does, you know, unless you're in a situation where this is a high profile case where, you know, you're a referee in Britney Spears's conservatorship. I don't think you're going to have a lot of uh, media attention knocking down the door trying to sit in on your referee proceeding. And that may uh, have a lot of appeal to clients, particularly when they're talking about uh, their private financial information, uh, their relationships with family members, uh, capacity issues for family members, things like that. Uh, you can also get someone that has a lot of expertise on the issue. So in Contra Costa and Alameda, we're blessed with judges who uh, have practiced in the area and sat on the bench for a long time. But that isn't the case in a lot of other counties. You've got some counties that view probate as the place for new judges to cut their teeth. And you've got judges who have come in who have, gosh, never thought of trust in the state since they passed the bar. If you want someone that's going to get into uh, really the uh, substance of the case and understand these issues that can be complex to trust in estates specifically, uh, you have the ability to select someone with that expertise. Uh, and then an issue that I think Ryan will develop is this ability for the referee trained in ADR to transition between the neutral and the, uh, the mediator role. Uh, and you can likewise leverage Zoom uh, and other technology more. So even though our courts are starting to use that for general uh, morning hearings, short cause, that isn't the case for trials. They're still being done in person. Uh, you can make a uh, more comfortable setting for your clients. Uh, and more accessible to you and the parties by having uh, the matters facilitated through Zoom or other remote technology, which a referee has the flexibility to do. And lastly, the informality of the setting can make it easier for you to extract better testimony from your clients. I can't count the number of times that I've prepared a client or a witness to testify. They do great. They crush it when we go over their testimony ahead of time. We go and sit down in the courtroom, they get sworn in, they're sitting in this big room up on a bench next to a judge with a bailiff and, and people really grilling them and they tense up uh, after they take that oath and it really affects the ability of them to give compelling testimony. And I think by having this uh, more informal setting, it can make them feel more at ease uh, and you can get better testimony out of your witnesses uh, and get to the heart of the issues easier. So just like we've got benefits, we've got risks as well. The first one uh, and the one that, that clients always raise is the cost. And I think, like I said before, that this is something you want to balance against the cost of trial. You know, you're not just looking at the expense of the referee in a vacuum. You're looking at what the alternative is. What's it going to cost your client to go through multiple continuances, to have to wait months on end to get their matter heard, uh, to come back uh, week after week to get half a day uh, and have to re-educate uh, witnesses or the court on uh, the matter that's pending before them. Uh, the risk of the client blaming the lawyer for an adverse result. I think this is not something that's really going to be uh, getting them anywhere, but it's something that uh, I, as an attorney, am cognizant of when I'm approaching my client uh, to discuss a referee appointment. Clients like to point their finger at someone else uh, when it comes to losing a case, and there is the possibility that they get an adverse result from a referee and they blame their lawyer, gosh, why'd you let me go with that referee? And I think a really important way to diffuse this situation on the front end is to make sure you have your clients buy in to the referee process. Sit down with them and explain to them why this process is advantageous. Go through different options for referees and explain why you think the referee is a good fit and have them, uh, you know, have, them have buy in into the vetting of the referees themselves so that they feel uh, invested in this referee being the right choice to resolve their case. Um, and just as informality can lead to better, uh, better testimony, it can lead to some bad actions by the parties and counsel. You know, there have been innumerable times when I've sat in a room with uh, two parties in a discovery dispute and the lawyers just get after each other. 
um, you'll start yelling and pointing fingers and making ad hominem attacks. And I know that if we were sitting in Department 30 or Department 15 or 201 or 202 with one of our judges or commissioners, there is no way that they would act that way, but they feel comfortable doing so because it's an informal setting. And part of what you want there is a, a referee that's willing to take control of the situation and make sure that the parties uh, recognize the, uh, the decorum of the proceeding, that this is still a judicial proceeding uh, and that it's important not only to stay focused on the issues, but to maintain the buy-in from the parties that the parties recognize this is a legal proceeding and it's respected by the parties and the referee. Uh, and that's in large part uh, the referee's job to control that situation and obviously the attorney's role to conduct themselves appropriately. And then lastly, I, I hear from time to time from clients uh, concerns that there's gonna be some bias by the referee uh, in favor of repeat business. I have yet to see that happen. You know, everyone uh, in the county has probably used a few of the same referees multiple times, but more importantly, there's a disclosure that the referee has to make at the outset of the work that they've done with each of the parties and the attorneys. And I think that's a real opportunity to go over uh, the uh, connections between the referee and the parties and, and diffuse this concern at the outset with the client. So that's it for referees. I say that's it like it was short. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan for the, the stipulated temporary judges and 730 experts. Okay, thanks, Andy. That was that was terrific. I'm I'm going to move pretty quickly through a lot of the material. So, as I'm going through this process, if you have questions, please put the put your questions in the Q and A. If we can't answer them today, then um, you're of course invited to email Andy and me, and we'll happily answer them. First thing I want to do is take a step back. Now that we've gone through referees under 638 and 639, and we pivot to temporary judges and to uh, experts under Evidence Code 730. Um, where we are, um, trust in the state litigation, as we all know, it's growing. Um, you can see it, you can see it from the the number of practitioners in this field. When I started many years ago, there were just a few practitioners. Now we have a lot of practitioners in this field. So that is a sign. Why is it growing? Well, we have a lot of people entering retirement age. We got the baby boomer generation entering the retirement age. We have an increasing mobility and transience in our society. We have um, an increasing number of people in second and third marriages. And here in the Bay Area, it's in particular a hotbed of trust and state litigation because there's a lot of wealth. There's a, a very high divorce rate. I think two of the counties in the Bay Area have the highest divorce rates in the country. And we have a large number of elderly people living here. Um, there's going to be, and there there. It's happening now, it's going to continue to happen that there's, there's a massive amount of wealth transfer going on and disputes associated uh, with that uh, wealth transfer due to these factors I just discussed. We can expect trust and estate litigation, therefore, to increase. We're going to have more people than ever who are elderly, who are, uh, have declining capacity without some or all of their family members nearby and with the potential for favoring one set of heirs over another, another set of heirs and asset distribution, this is really the perfect storm for trust and estate litigation. The stipulated temporary judge, like the referees, is a byproduct of this substantial increase in trust and estate litigation. Um, combined with uh, the overwhelmed judicial system we have here in California, as well as the budget constraints on the court system, so this is, this is gonna continue. And like I said, we need to be creative and thinking of solutions uh, due to the congestion of our courts and the, and the underfunding. Um, so let's talk stipulated temporary judges. As Andy pointed out, the difference here um, with referees under 638 and 639 is that referees are a statutory, um, uh, they're, they're a statutory being. So they are constrained by the words under, um, CCP 638 at seek. In contrast, a stipulated uh, temporary judge, they have authority under the California Constitution. That's Article 6, Section 21 of the California Constitution. What that um, section says is that on stipulation of the party's litigant, the court may order a cause to be tried by a temporary judge who's a member of the state bar sworn in and empowered to act until the final determination of the cause. So we have a constitution power and the scope of the temporary judge 
is really determined by the stipulation of the parties. The, the parties can really determine um, the scope of their trial, the scope of the power of the temporary judge. Ryan, How, right yep. there? So, so when you mentioned that, you talked about the parties litigant. So when we've got a situation in probate where you may have 15 family members that are getting notice, do you have to get all of them to stipulate? No. So there is a case um, that I believe is going to be in the article that's coming out, authored by Andy and me, um, that addresses that issue and basically says that the parties who have appeared in court, those are the parties who have to stipulate to, um, to the temporary judge. The other parties who have received notice but have not appeared do not need to stipulate. Um, so let's talk about how the, and I don't have that site in front of you today, but it'll be in our article and we're, we'll be happy to provide it to you if you'd like. So let's talk about how a temporary judge proceeding is commenced. It's commenced again by a written stipulation of the parties moving along in the court system. The parties must approve the temporary judge by signing a written stipulation stating the name and office address of the member of the state bar agreed upon. You see there it's California rule of court 2.831A. There's no requirement that a temporary judge have any prior experience as a judicial officer. They merely must be a member of the state bar. The parties must submit the stipulation for approval to the presiding judge or the judge designated by the presiding judge in the superior court in which the case is pending. Uh, the presiding judge or the presiding judge's designee must sign the order on that stipulation and the order must be filed with the court in which the case is pending. That's California Rule of Court 2.831B. The stipulation by the parties should specify the temporary judge's role. Also, it should specify the names of the parties and counsel, um, all of whom should sign the stipulation, the date set for trial, the number of days for trial, the location, and the completion date of the matter. The parties have the power to define and circumscribe circumscribe the authority of a temporary judge. That's a Stephen A case that's cited here to my point, really the parties are dictating the scope of the, uh, the, scope of the authority of the temporary judge in the proceeding. Uh, the parties may authorize the temporary judge to uh, hear evidence and render a decision on all of the issues in the case. Alternatively, the, the parties may elect to use a temporary judge for one or two key issues. In the legal dispute, perhaps they have an understanding that a determination of that of those issues will give rise to a global settlement of all other issues. Like Andy said, it may be inefficient uh, to just try a few issues. On the other hand, if the parties are confident it could facilitate a, a settlement, uh, just stipulating to a few issues may be the more efficient route. All right. Um, before serving, um, the temporary judge must take and subscribe the oath of office and certify that they're aware of and will comply with the applicable provisions of Canon 6 of the Code of Judicial Ethics and the California Rules of Court. What does Canon 6 say? It says that the judge shall uphold the integrity and the independence of the judiciary, shall avoid impropriety, uh, shall avoid the appearance of impropriety and other things. Yeah, I welcome you all to take a look at Canon 6. As part of the requirement to comply with Canon 6, the temporary judge must no later than five days after their designation as temporary judge disclose to the parties any matter subject to disclosure under the Code of Judicial Ethics. That's California Rule of Court 2.831D. What this means is at minimum, uh, the temporary judge must state the number of cases uh, they've had with each firm during the prior 24 months, as well as any other interests or relationships that warrant disclosure under CCP 170 at seek. Um, okay, the temporary judge once appointed has all the powers of a sitting judge with a few exceptions. For example, a temporary judge is, lacks authority to sit to seal a file. That's California rule of court 2.835 and also lacks the authority to approve a confidentiality agreement. The party should go to the assigned trial judge in the superior court where the case is pending for those items. Um, the, the court must post information about the temporary judge proceeding in the court facility so that the, anyone in the public can, can find out what's going on with this case. Must include the name, phone, address of, of a person to contact to, to obtain information about the date, 
time, location, and general nature of the proceeding. Um, that's California Rule of Court 2.834B. The setting of a temporary judge uh, proceeding, this is similar to what Andy was saying with a referee proceeding, it's usually informal. Uh, for example, a conference room at a dispute resolution center, such as ADR services or jams. I find I've done a number of these and I find them to be very convenient. Why do I say that? Um, both for the parties and the council. Well, you have greater access to computers, you have greater access to client files, um, you have breakout rooms where you can prep your uh, client and other witnesses. Um, you have uh, better cell phone service and internet. And I can't underscore how important that is. Court facilities generally cannot be used unless there's a finding by the presiding judge or their designee that uh, the court facilities use would further the interest of justice. Um, the per, also the presiding judge or their designee on application of any person or on the judge's own motion may order uh, that the case uh, can be heard at a site easily accessible to the public in appropriate for seating for those who have made known their plan to attend the hearings. The application must state the facts showing good cause for granting that application. That's California Rule of Court 2.834D. All right, um, a temporary judge is typically paid usually at an hourly rate. Uh, the, par the parties uh, typically make the payment to the dispute resolution center, again, again, a place like JAMS or ADR services or directly to the temporary judge if the temporary judge is unaffiliated with a dispute resolution center. The rules applicable to a temporary judge um, proceeding are the same rules applicable to the case proceeding in the superior court where the case is pending. For example, the CCP, uh, the evidence code, the local rules of the superior court where the case is pending. Um, notably, however, the, as, as Andy was talking about uh, with referees, temporary judges typically will be more flexible. And that's another, that's an advantage of the temporary judge proceeding. They're more flexible with the rules of evidence, code of civil procedure. It's, it's oftentimes more akin to an arbitration but without the strict rules on appeal. And most temporary judges in my experience will defer to the party's preferences on how to proceed. The originals of proceedings submitted to the temporary judge must be filed with the superior court in which the case is pending. Uh, most temporary judges encourage the parties to stipulate to issues, including presentation of evidence, order of witnesses, undisputed facts, law, authenticity of evidence, you know, we find that our probate judges in, in Contra Costa and Alameda are really good at this too. They really encourage the parties to stipulate. You'll find that temporary judges do the same thing. Uh, temporary judge ruling is subject to the same broad appeal rights as a ruling by a superior court judge. This is what differentiates temporary judges proceedings from arbitrations. Arbitrations often are criticized because you're allowing one person or a panel of three to make a ruling and the rights to appeal are uh, very restricted, not with a temporary judge, same broad appeal rights as you have with a trial court judge. And that's, you see the city of Shasta case here, a judgment entered by a temporary judge is a judgment subject to appeal. It goes on to address that issue. All right, considerations for selecting a temporary judge or referee. Um, I can't underscore how important this is. Uh, the process of selecting your temporary judge is, is arguably the most critical decision in the proceeding because the temporary judge uh, will be rendering the ruling in your case. Um, a temporary judge is a human being. They have all of their pre-existing predilections. So you need to choose carefully. So let's go through the factors. And these are very similar to what Andy covered uh, with the referee. Uh, the un un uninterrupted availability during the desired hearing or trial dates, um, you know, versus in court, the delays we're seeing and getting a hearing date or a court date for trial, some Bay Area probate courts, we have the initial hearing date 10 months or so after filing an initial petition. The delays caused um, by having interrupted trial schedules, interrupted hearings, it, it causes massive costs by the continued reprepping by lawyers and experts. You know, I think the immediate reaction by most people is that no, we don't want a private judge. We don't want a referee because of the costs. But when you really crunch the numbers and look at the cost of having delays in the court system, 
and the reprepping by lawyers and, and uh, experts, oftentimes the cost is going to be more in the courts than in these private proceedings where you're paying the referee or paying the temporary judge. Okay, what else is important when selecting a temporary judge? Um, their expertise and trust and probate as a practitioner, a judge, a mediator, um, subfields, uh, sub, uh, sub subject matters that are important in our cases and that we frequently run into, accountings, securities, family law, real property. Having a temporary judge who's familiar with these areas reduces the time during trial where you need to educate the judge, increases the likelihood that the trial judge, that the temporary judge is gonna understand the evidence and it reduces the time uh, for obtaining a ruling on the case. The cost, I just went through that with you. Unfortunately, as with referees, typically the, the most, uh, the top temporary judges have the highest per hour rate. Uh, but I I'd like you to think about it through this lens. lens. Their expertise on the substitute, substantive issues and the procedure may prove more cost effective by allowing them to proceed at a faster rate in the case than a less reputable judge um, who has a lower um, hourly rate. Often, you know, people say the same thing about lawyers. You're paying more for a, for a lawyer who's going to be more efficient. Um, other factors that are important, the reputation for competence and rigor, judicial temperament, uh, their attitude towards adherence to the rules of evidence and CCP, their attitude towards informal resolution of discovery uh, in other pretrial disputes, for example, by preventing formal motion practice that is very costly in the trial courts. Their reputation in dispute resolution, Andy touched on this. Um, you know, generally when I think of um, folks in the dispute resolution world, I think of facilitative versus evaluative and evaluative um, mediator will often look at the merits of the case and try to get the parties to what they believe um, is is the place where a judge would determine the case, whereas a facilitative mediator will look at, will, will be most concerned with getting the, the parties to a median point where he, where he or she thinks they can get them to resolve the case. Why is it important to think about their evaluative versus facilitative reputation? Well, I've had uh, at least a couple of matters that, that were proceeding in a referee or a temporary judge proceeding and the parties then pivoted into dispute resolution. And they signed waivers um, allowing the temporary judge to serve as the mediator, which of course is dangerous, but the parties were confident they could resolve it. So it's helpful to understand if the parties are interested in doing that, you, you understand uh, whether they're evaluative or facilitative or somewhere in, in between. And then lastly, uh, the pre-existing relationship between the temporary judge and counsel, Andy already discussed that. I won't get into that issue. You know, one important other thing now that we've been in this COVID world since March of 2020, um, in my experience, it's also important to have somebody who has a command of technology. Uh, most hearings and trials are now by video. Most mediations are now by video, whether it blue jeans or Zoom. Um, it'd be helpful to have somebody who knows what they're doing so you're not incurring delays while you're um, proceeding with hearings and trials via Zoom or Blue Jeans. I'm just gonna briefly touch on the most common and useful approaches uh, for locating a temporary judge uh, that's appropriate for your case. Um, online via a dispute resolution center's website like uh, ADR services or JAMS, uh, you'll have a bio on each of the temporary judge. Confer with practicing lawyers in the community um, we're a small community, trust and estate litigation and trust and estate lawyers. So you can often find a lot of helpful feedback from the folks that uh, you see in court um, on a regular basis. And lastly, importantly, review published decisions of those individuals who have served as judges. Um, you can't imagine what you can find in those decisions when they were on the bench that may indicate a tendency to favor trustees or beneficiaries or a tendency to rule on a particular side of an issue. All right. So Ryan, sorry, before we move off that one, we, we talked a little earlier about ways that we can use this to um, uh, avoid some of the delays in, uh, in the trial court uh, hearing schedules. Um, do you think you could talk a little bit about the way that uh, these could be used in uncontested matters to try and uh, administer trusts or estates? Sure. Um, 
you know, as a preface to that question, I, th I think, you know, one of probably the most frustrating things, both for the practitioners and the probate judges, is when we have an uncontested matter like a Hegstead petition. And uh, by virtue of the backlogs in the court, we file an uncontested petition and, um, and the court sets the hearing on an uncontested petition um, nine months away. And, the, and it's uncertain whether they're gonna, going to entertain an ex parte. Um, so Andy and I think this is a great opportunity to use a temporary judge. Um, when you file your uncontested petition with the court, also submit a request for a temporary judge. Um, see if you can get a stipulation from all the parties uh, for a temporary judge. And if you can, um, get that in front of the court, have the court sign off on it and have the temporary judge proceed with the uncontested petition. Um, it's a great way to expedite this matter. Uh, have it done within, you know, within weeks rather than months. And um, you know, a lot of these uncontested petitions um, the beneficiary, you know, they pertain to beneficiaries who are often elderly people um, needing the funds, um, wanting to um, administer their estates, um, handling other issues for elders, extending property into a trust, important issues that can really be expedited. So we think, we certainly think this is a great vehicle for uncontested petitions, for example, Hexted petitions. And just a shameless plug, Ryan and I have an article coming out, uh, I think tomorrow or the next day in the recorder that goes through some of the nuts and bolts of this process. Keep an eye out for it. And we've also got in your materials a uh, form stipulation uh, where you can fill in the blanks for appointment of a uh, temporary judge that uh, you could go ahead and submit along with the petition to see if you can get matters uh, expedited, particularly when you're in counties with an eight, nine, 10 month uh, lag time for your uncontested hearings. Okay, so let's get into evidence code 730 experts. Um, this is a great cartoon, Andy. Um, <laughs> I don't know where to go with it, but I think it's a good segue into this topic. Okay, um, 730 experts, I certainly think this is an underutilized part of our practice and the court's practice. Um, 730 experts can be very useful as a, as a vehicle to facilitate settlement, to gain leverage over a litigant's opponent, um, and or to move a case more efficiently through the court process. All right, there's uh, evidence code 730. I'm not gonna read it all to you just out of, uh, out of time, but basically the, the key part is the court may appoint an expert on its own motion or on a motion of any party. Um, may, uh, in the, in the expert may investigate or render a report as may be ordered by the court, testify as an expert at the trial of the action. Um, and the court um, generally will fix compensation and determine and have the discretion on how to allocate that compensation among the parties. All right. Um, why is evidence code 730 experts, why is it underutilized? Um, I think simply it's not on the radar of, much, of most lawyers and courts uh, often are unwilling to expand the scope and complexity of a case on their own, sua sponte by appointing an expert if the lawyers are not seeking an expert. I think the more cynical view uh, would be that lawyers are incentivized by the prospect of higher attorney's fees and having each side in a dispute that requires experts hire their own experts, take discovery on those experts, uh, file briefs, motions in limine, conduct trial testimony on those experts leads to a higher attorney fees than having the court appoint an expert. As a corollary to that point, let me just emphasize some points on why appointing a 730 expert is a good idea. And these really revolve around the idea of efficiency. Having the court appoint an evidence code 730 expert will frame the key issues in the case and avoid time and expense of the parties haggling over what are the important issues in the case, spending time on those issues that the court will ultimately deem to be irrelevant. Um, also having the court appoint a 730 expert likely will promote settlement. Um, the court likely will follow the opinion of its appointed expert and the parties know that. And 730 experts are particularly useful um, and will be more likely agreed to be useful by the parties in a case in which there's a smaller amount of damages or smaller amount of assets and controversy the parties don't want to incur the costs, the significant costs of, of hiring their own experts. Um, in this slide, we see some examples of 
cases that discussed uh, a 730 expert appraisals, handwriting, psychologist, standard of care. I'm gonna identify two other areas that I think are very useful to have a 730 expert. One is forensic accounting. Um, I have a matter right now uh, where we're dealing with tracing community property and separate property um, and trying to figure out what the composition of, the, of each is after my client's father passed away and their stepmother is alive and fighting uh, the character of property issue. Um, complex probate code accountings where you have businesses and partnerships and you really need someone to get in there to trace the assets. Another, another area where a 730 expert, and I'm gonna get into this in more detail in a little while, um, is an elder's capacity. Um, a, a, a neuropsychologist addressing an elder's capacity who's a settler, still alive, and we're trying to figure out uh, their, their due process rights, their ability to represent themselves, hire their own lawyer, all of those issues. Okay, the process for appointment of an expert. All right, so it can, as I discussed before, a 730 expert can uh, be appointed either by the court on its own motion or any party may file a notice motion to appoint an expert. Uh, what do you need to include in the motion and the order? You need to identify the expert, uh, the scope of the issues to be investigated and reported and how compensation will be calculated and paid. All right, um, under evidence code 732, this is an interesting area. So an expert appointed by the court uh, may be called and examined by the court and by any party in the action. When such a witness is called and examined by the court, the parties have the same right as under 775 of the evidence code to cross-examine the witness and object to the questions asked and the evidence adduced. Now, we need to be careful here because the judge um, who appointed the expert may take offense to aggressive or hostile examination of its witness or to objections to the judge's own questions. So that's what really differentiates this area from, from experts who are appointed by the parties. Um, I uh, cited here rule of court 7.1016. This addresses the appointment of 730 experts in guardianship matters and more particularly circumstances when a ward should or should not testify in the latter circumstance, the, uh, the rule of court addresses appropriate circumstances for the court to appoint a court or county investigator or child custody, custody evaluator under 730 to meet with the, meet with the ward and, and report back to the court. Um, it's a complicated area. I uh, suggest you look at 7.1016 if you wanna learn more. All right, 731. Uh, discusses expert fees. Really the point here is um, if the court appoints a medical expert for its own needs um, and if the superior court so provides, the charge of, of that um, appointed expert shall be a charge against the court. If, um, the, if in any county where a board of supervisors so provides, the compensation under 730 for a medical expert shall be a charge uh, paid out of the treasury of that county. Uh, on order of the court if it's an issue other than the court's needs. But as a practical matter, when we, when we approach 730 experts, your expectation should be that the court's gonna order the parties to pay and the court's going to apportion the cost between the parties in its discretion. All right, um, let me get into the benefits and risks of the court appointed experts. Uh, this is really the last area I believe we have the benefits. Okay, if a case, if you have a case that's strong on the merits, appoint having the court appoint an expert and, and obtaining what we expect would be a, a positive uh, opinion from that expert will put pressure on your opponent. Um, could help facilitate a settlement in the case. That's uh, good for your client. Um, okay, as I was saying before, um, 730 experts are particularly useful in contested actions involving elders with diminished capacity who are still alive. I give three examples here. One is conservatorships um, to evaluate whether the proposed conservatee is able to manage their affairs. Another example is a financial elder abuse matter where the extent of the elder's capacity may be important um, on the issue of compensatory and probate code 859 damages that are assessed by the court. An interesting area is inter vivos trust contest petitions. Um, must the settler be conserved to proceed in with an inter vivos 
trust contest petition by Intervivos trust contest. What I'm talking about is the settler who's being alleged to have lack capacity or be unduly influenced to create a trust or a trust amendment. Um, they're still alive. And we have this Drake v. Pinkham case out there that says, well, if you wait until the settler dies, you may be barred by latches from bringing the contest. So if the settler is still alive um, and the petitioner or, or any party believes that the settler lacks capacity, um, how, must the, how must the case proceed? I have one case in San Mateo right now where the judge determined that the settler does not need to first be conserved. Instead, a GAL appointed for the settler is appropriate and the, and the court bifurcated the case. And the first stage in the case is going to be a determination of the settler's capacity involving the appointment of a 730 expert. And if, if it's deemed that the settler lacks capacity and therefore um, our client has standing to proceed, the second part is going to be the contest. Um, all right, and importantly, there's no prohibition to appointing uh, your own expert in addition to the court appointing a 730 expert. Um, we cite their uh, evidence code 733. What are the risks to appointing a 730 expert? Um, uh, if your case is weak on the merits, you can lose leverage with an adverse report or testimony. Uh, the cost of the expert, as with temporary judges and referees, good experts are expensive. You could be looking at $300 or more, and those add up really quickly once you have, a, for example, a neuropsychologist conducting examinations and reports. You could have potential delays in the expert's investigation and preparation of the report. Uh, good, good neuropsychologists and good handwriting experts, they are busy, uh, so you may incur delay. Um, a judge may view a party's request to appoint a 730 expert as an insult to the judge's ability to understand or determine the facts on their own. However, in my experience, judges most likely will welcome a 730 um, evidence code 730 motion and appointment of an expert. The judges, most judges will happily cede uh, to an expert for a determination on an issue that the expert can opine on, report back to the court, making the judge's job easier and less time consuming. Lastly, there's a risk that there could be potential ambiguities in the expert's report that could further cloud the issues. Some experts tend to use qualifying language in their reports. Um, some simply are not good writers and the language they use creates further ambiguity, which creates further litigation over the meaning in their reports. Um, and I think that's it. We're right at 1.30. Um, uh, Andy, do we have any questions? Yeah, so uh, we've got one question in here, um, which is, are 730 experts fees a recoverable cost? Um, that's like most good answers, I'm going to say maybe. There's uh, a case that uh, held that they were recoverable uh, when appointed by the court. And if you want to take a look, it's Kennedy versus Byram. Uh, 20 Cal Reporter 98 or 21 Cal App 2nd 474. Uh, there's another case out there that held that the referee or the uh, expert's work leading up to it was a recoverable cost, but not the time for testimony. And that's Metropolitan Water District versus Adams, uh, 23 Cal second, 770. And I think that's the only question we've got in there. You can see Ryan and my email addresses up there. You are all welcome to send us emails with any other questions you may have. Um, and thank you for having us. Thank, thank you, you, gentlemen. Uh, that was wonderful. And uh, I, again, we, you filled up your time and there, there are no questions, so I think it'll be great. So thank you very much. And uh, everyone enjoy the rest of your week. And well, 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 we'll see y'all tomorrow. We'll see y'all tomorrow, same time. Thank you, man. Thanks, okay. everybody. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.